Good evening um, and welcome to William and Mary Law School on Zoom. Um, I am Jamie Welch Donahue. I'm the Director of Communications at the Law School and a member of the Law School Advancement Office. Um, it's my great pleasure to host this panel tonight um, on behalf of the Law School JD Admissions Office. Um, before we begin, I should let you know that um, this session is being recorded. I'm going to start by introducing our participants, uh, then ask a couple questions. And as we get towards the halfway point, um, I will open it up on chat for um, everyone who's watching. Uh, please feel free to, to put, a, put a question in. So our panelists, um, let me begin by introducing uh, Professor Stacy Kern Shearer, uh, who is Director of Clinical Programs, Director of the Immigration Clinic and Clinical Professor of Law. She is a graduate of Beloit College and Boston University School of Law. She holds a master's degree in public health from Boston University School of Public Health. <clears throat> Prior to joining the William & Mary faculty, she served as assistant counsel in the U.S. Senate Office of the Legislative Council. She is the founding director of the law school's immigration clinic. Professor Kern Shearer has been recognized with the Kelly Professorship for teaching and also has been voted Professor of the Year by the class of 2017 and the class of 2021. Jane Nicole Medved is an adjunct professor and an Immigrant Justice Corps Fellow in the Immigration Clinic. She is a graduate of George Washington University and William and Mary Law School. As a law student, she participated in our Domestic Violence Clinic and the Family Law Clinic. Prior to returning to William and Mary and Williamsburg, uh, she was an Immigrant Justice Corps Fellow at Safe Horizon in New York. Mitchell Harrison is a third year law student at William & Mary who can share his firsthand experience as a student in the Immigration Clinic. He is a graduate of the University of Chicago. He has had a number of very interesting work experiences while in law school. He has served as a legal researcher for our university's Global Research Institute, and a cybersecurity intern at the Coastal Virginia Center for Cyber Innovation. More recently, in the summer following his second year of law school, he was the legal intern with the US Mission to the United Nations. Um, also joining us on the call is uh, Michelle Rahman, who is associate dean, interim associate dean for JD Admissions and uh, Financial Aid. And she was just sharing with us a few minutes ago that she has done more than 170, is that the number, Michelle, of Zoom interviews with prospective students? Um, and she continues in those efforts. Um, let me begin uh, with a first question, question, and I will ask this with, um, direct this to Professor Kern Shearer. Um, for many of us who are not law students or uh, law faculty, um, what is a law school clinic and how does it fit into um, a student's legal education. Yeah, well, thanks, Jamie. And thank you for everyone who is joining us and taking time out of your evening uh, to learn more about, about the Immigration Clinic and about William & Mary. So what is a law school clinic? Uh, you may be learning about what a clinic is when you're doing your research on, on law schools and the role that clinics play. Um, clinics are part of you know, what we call you know, experiential learning in, in legal education today. So clinics are really an opportunity for students to get out of the classroom uh, and you know, away from the, the, the doc, what we call the doctrinal or the podium course readings where you, you, know, you read cases and you learn the principles and you apply them to hypothetical situations. Clinics are really the place where it goes from the hypothetical to the, to the real. And so in clinics, uh, students have the opportunity to represent uh, clients uh, under the supervision of supervising attorneys and, and the professors in the clinics uh, to carry out, you know, legal representation uh, based on whatever type of clinic uh, it may be. So obviously tonight we'll talk about, you know, really with respect to the immigration clinic at William & Mary, but, you know, we have several clinics in the law school and each of those, and I can talk a little bit more about them in a minute, um, if you'd like, but, um, you know, each of those really gives students hands-on experience and what it is like to really, what I always say is like, what it's like to lawyer, what it's like to really, you know, be someone's advocate and, and their representation, because there's a lot that you don't learn um, in the classroom. Obviously, you learn a lot about how to think and about how to 
analyze and about how to sort of think through issues and, and kind of identify the law and apply them to facts. But there's so much more outside of the classroom and the skills that you need uh, to really be an effective advocate that are really interpersonal, that are really about the skills in interacting with clients and colleagues and opposing counsel at the court and all the things that you're that you may have to do um, when you get out of law school. So the clinics really provide an opportunity for that hands on experience. Um, and Professor Kernshear, can you tell us a little bit about the types of challenges or kind of legal situations of the people that you serve in the clinic? Sure, in the immigration clinic specifically, um, absolutely. So in the immigration clinic, we focus on what, you know, is kind of known or called humanitarian forms of immigration relief. So we focus um, on our, you know, on clients um, in our Hampton Roads community. So Williamsburg is on a peninsula and in, in southeastern Virginia, sometimes called the Tidewater area of Virginia, sometimes called Hampton Roads. So this is the area really from Virginia Beach, like to where we are. And so, you know, the, the immigration clinic, we focus um, our efforts to represent non-citizens in the Hampton Roads community um, who are seeking and who, who need assistance in seeking some type of humanitarian immigration relief. So what does that mean? That can mean individuals who are seeking asylum, either, be, either before the Department of Homeland Security or people who are in immigration court and who are asserting asylum as a defense to removal from the United States. Uh, we also uh, represent individuals um, who are seeking um, assistance and a pathway you know, in immigration under the Violence Against Women Act. Um, which are, you know, sort of particular um, pathways that are available to um, survivors of intimate partner violence. Uh, and then also we do a lot of what are called U visas, and these are visas for um, non-citizens who have been um, the victim of some type of violent crime in the United States. Uh, we also assist uh, DACA holders and um, individuals who are applying for naturalization. Uh, so those are the sort of the top areas. We do some other areas as well, but I would say asylum, U visas, uh, Violence Against Women Act, um, and naturalization are are the areas that we really spend a lot of our a lot of our time on. Um, my next question uh, is either for Mitchell and Nicole or uh, both, and I wanted to ask if they wanted to kind of share um, not only about the skills they gained. Uh, through their clinic experience, but also um, kind of how they grew as people or as legal professionals, um, if that's something uh, you can address. Say, so, Mitch, do you want me to put you put you on the spot to go first, or <laughs> would you prefer I go first? Um, I can go first, uh, I suppose. Um, so I think, I think, uh, I think, as as the professor said, uh, the practical aspect of the clinic is just something that has really enabled me to grow because there's there's a sort of a fear that uh, is common among law students. I think of we're learning all these things in classes. We we're learning like how to think, how to like argument, or how to make arguments about these Supreme Court cases and all of these things. Um, but there's a very real feel of like fear of like, okay, but what do we do? in actual practice? What do we do in the real world? How do we, how do we actually be a lawyer? Um, and so I think just, just very practical things of like interacting with clients, making like filling out forms properly, um, asking the right questions to get to the right documents that you need. These sound like fundamental and basic skills and they are, but I think, I think just the act of doing them, the act of interacting with clients and doing that over and over again really does does help not only you has helped me build those skills, but also has helped me build my confidence. And yes, I can do this. This is something that I can learn and do and then apply in, in a real world setting. Thank you. And really to bounce off of that, because I'm sure there's some people listening who, you know, are hearing, well, Nicole's an immigration attorney. Why did she do the domestic violence and family law clinics? Um, one, the immigration clinic was not here when I was a law student. Um, but also, I think this goes to something really important about how great the clinical experience can be in that it is an opportunity to 
either really dig deep on an area of law that you want to pursue as your career. Maybe we have some future immigration attorneys in the Zoom or watching this as a recording, um, but many of you may not be. And this is a great opportunity to learn about other areas of law, get that practical experience and get transferable skills. You know, holding a trauma-informed interview with somebody who is a survivor of domestic violence, you know, from Central America, you're going to learn how to work with an interpreter. You're going to learn how to have a trauma-informed interview to talk about some really difficult things. And then you're going to be applying that in a complex area of law, reading lots of legal documents, whether from this country, from Virginia, like protective orders and things like that, or police reports and protective orders from their country. And so you're applying a lot of different skills that you can then use in a lot of different areas after you practice. So whether that's doing pro bono immigration work after graduation, um, for me being in the domestic violence and family law clinics, getting really familiar with those protective orders and things that we're seeing every single day in the kinds of cases that we do and being able to help clients just kind of know what that is and being able to help students like Mitch read all these documents and then apply them in the cases that we're working on. So it's really a lot of transferable skills that you get out of your time in the clinic that will pay off for years and years and years down the line. Thank you. Thank you. And just to um, maybe back up a little bit, um, the immigration clinic is only one of uh, the clinics that we offer. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to call on uh, Professor Kernshear to walk us through. Uh, the, with all the clinics that we offer at William Mary. <laughs> yes. Right. So we do have we have eight uh, clinics right now at the law school. Um, so in addition to the immigration clinic, we have the family law clinic, the domestic violence clinic, which you know, ones that Nicole was was referencing. Um, we have the innocence project. We have the elder and disability law uh, clinic. We have the veterans benefits cl clinic. We have the low income taxpayer clinic. We have the appellate and Supreme Court clinic. And I think I've hit them all. I think that I think that was all of them. Um, so you know, as you see, like there's there's a range of different types of areas of law that you can that you can work in um, in the in the uh, clinical program, and so you know I think that's something important to remember is what Nicole was mentioning about transferable skills. You know, so you're like I don't know I don't know which clinic I would want to take, and that's okay. You know, um, so you know you can really think about the skills that you would learn in any clinic are really transferable um, to practice because in all of our clinics you're going to be getting that hands on. Um, experience. I think with the immigration, um, you know, the immigration clinic, we really do dovetail a lot with, you know, the skills learned in the domestic violence clinic, although there are some differences in terms of like appearing in court and what court would you appear in. So there are, there are differences, but certainly, um, you know, our clinic in particular with the immigration clinic, we obviously are focusing um, on, you know, all of our clients, um, pretty much all of our clients have, you know, experienced um, some kind of, of, of trauma either in the United States or in their home country um, or, or sometimes in both places. And so, as Nicole mentioned, um, we really do focus in the immigration clinic on trauma-informed um, advocacy and what and thinking about what that means and how even, you know, if you learn um, how to be an advocate in a trauma-informed context, those skills are transferable to like so many different areas of the law. And honestly, I think that, you know, you become an even more um, attuned and empathetic and, and skilled advocate um, when you start with that baseline, um, you know, serving, serving our population that we serve. Um, one of the things I was wondering is it, it can be a one semester um, experience or a two semester experience. Can you um, kind of walk us through do you spend the early sort of your syllabus? Do you spend the early part um, kind of giving a in depth about the type of law, uh, and then uh -huh. go into the meeting clients um, and the whole uh, in interesting thing of that you're serving as sort of training wheels for these uh -huh. students? Yeah. Okay. So this is yeah. We could spend a long time talking about this. Like, how does this work? Um, and so, like, really. Uh, you know, it's important to, to know that, you know, there's no prerequisite uh, for the clinic other than, you know, fi finishing your first year of law school and getting in in the ad in the in the registration process. Um, so, you know, we don't assume any knowledge 
um, of immigration law when you come into the clinic. So that could that could be a, that could be a challenge. And, and but I mean, it could feel like one. I think much more to the students than it does honestly to Nicole and I. Um, so the way that you know it really works is that at the beginning of the semester, uh, you know, we really do kind of start. We start slow. And this is something that, you know, is really important to me in terms of like the pedagogy of how I run this clinic is that, you know, I'm not here to just sort of toss you into the deep end and figure out, if, you know, and see if you can swim like that. That's not what we're about here. Like, that's not how this is done. This is done in a way that is and that is thinking about, OK, I want to get you to a place where when you sit down with a client for the first time, you know, is it going to be are you going to be perfect? No. Are you going to be perfect for the 50th time you sit down with a client? No. I'm, you know, that's just the way life is. But when you can sit down with a client for the first time, you we've done enough to where you feel like, you know, you're going to be nervous, but you're going to have the confidence that like I'm prepared for this. So we spend the first few weeks um, kind of like running what I would say in, in parallel tracks. We're running like, you know, getting folks up to speed on, you know, what law, the substantive law that that is going to be applied in the cases they're working on. Also getting sort of a baseline and like talking about the skills that you need, kind of just, you know, how do you, you know, how do you construct a trauma-informed interview? Like, how do you work with an interpreter? You know, like really basic things. So you're kind of learning like the substantive law and learning sort of the basic practice skills, like at the same time through our classroom seminars. And while we're doing that in the classroom, what we're doing outside the classroom is having supervision and work and you get your client assignments and actually working through your client's case, you know, so how is what we're learning in this classroom, you know, applied to your client situation. So to give you an example, like if, um, if in the classroom, we're learning what are the elements of asylum, you know, what is it, what are the elements that you have to prove in order to assert an asylum claim? So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about what is persecution? Like what is nexus? Like what's a, you know, like what are the standards of these things? And then and then in the in supervision and in your casework, you're thinking, okay, I've got some basic facts from my that I know about my client, but what are some questions that I'm gonna have to ask my client in order to understand have they suffered past persecution? Like, is this, you know, what is the protected ground? Um, that they may be able to assert as the basis of their asylum claim. So you really are sort of working on, um, you know, different levels all at the same time, but we're very mindful of the, of the tracks that you're operating on. And really, Nicole and I are there um, to make sure that the students are very supported in learning how to do this. And I think it's also important to remember that unlike, you know, I teach like I've taught like the big immigration law, you know, doctrinal class. In that class, we're gonna we're gonna learn all the law. Like we're gonna learn well, not I mean not all of it, right? But we're gonna learn so many different um, aspects of immigration law. We're gonna go, you know, in family law and employment and 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 you know all sorts of things. And so we're gonna take a big picture. But in the clinic, I'm not gonna waste your time, and I'm not gonna waste my time teaching you something that you're not going to apply, right? So you don't need to learn all of immigration law to do an asylum case, right? You need to learn like, okay, what do I need to know to do this asylum case? and then apply it. So we're very mindful of making sure that, you know, it's going to be overwhelming just almost by the nature of it because it's a heavy thing. But, you know, I'm not here to, to overwhelm. We're here to work through the problem that our client has, and we're here to work through it together. So it really is about, you know, what I call sort of unfolding of what need what the students need to know at the right time in order to be able to to do to to work through and be the advocate for their client and not just sort of throwing everything at everybody all at once because that's it that's that's a little much right so we do it in a very like strategic and mindful way um thank you uh mm -hmm. i think i might back up just a little bit um uh with nicole, nicole and mitchell um so i'm assuming that a lot of people on this call uh, they know they want to be lawyers, but the question is, where are they going to go to law school, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about your discernment um, process, um, what you were looking for in a law school, um, what your expectations were, and maybe a little bit about your experience? Um, and I know, Mitchell, you haven't graduated yet, but uh, you're getting close. Sure, I'll I'll take this question first because it's been it's been the longest since I've since I've gone through the application process. Um, but I have to say, I was in in preparing for this panel. I was thinking about you know what was 
what was kind of the moment I knew I wanted to come to William and Mary? Like what was something that made William and Mary as I'm, you know, getting acceptance letters in and considering all the different places to go and weighing things about all the different schools, what made me say William and Mary is it? And it's actually talking to our alums and talking to our alums about clinics. So I had an adjunct professor at my undergrad who was an alum of William & Mary, and I talked to him about how I knew I wanted to work with survivors of trauma. I knew I wanted to, you know, I was graduating with an international affairs degree. I'm like, I'm pretty sure I want to do immigration law. I want to learn this and I want to explore, you know, international law and all these different components and all these different, all these different things. Where can I do that? And he said, go to William & Mary. And so, you know, especially conversations when thinking about how awesome our professors are um, and the opportunity to be in the clinics. And he was an alum of the domestic violence clinic. And so that inspired me to then sign up for it. And here we are today. Um, I'm talking way more about the domestic violence clinic than I am the immigration clinic. But by virtue of being an alum, that's where I was at. And so, you know, it was just really it really, really stood out to me that as he's recommending to me, how can you become a good lawyer? It was the offerings at William Mary, the diversity of the offerings at William Mary, and it was the clinics. So that is what made William Mary stand out to me when I was trying to decide between all these other great schools, what made William Mary stand out? That was it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mitchell? So it sounds like Nicole was a lot more prepared for the selection process than I was. Um, it's like the depth of her research, it seems, uh, exceeded mine considerably. Um, I was, when I was like looking for which law schools to apply to and ultimately like uh, how I landed on William and Mary, I confess that my process was not terribly romantic. I like, there are like listings of like what you get on the LSAT and like what, what GPA you need to like probably get into certain institutions. And so I went through those, I just sort of like, it was like calling it a cost benefit analysis seems maybe a little cold, but that is a lot of what it was. It's like, ultimately, like, I'm going to have to be paying for the school, paying for the loans. And also like, my goal is candidly to get a job, to like find success in a, in a, a geographic region of the, the country that I'm interested in, in living. Um, and so I, I was accepted into a couple of schools um, and, the reason that William and Mary uh, stuck out to me, not just because um, I was friend, uh, I, someone I was friends with in undergrad went here and seemed to have a very good time and uh, found success here, was um, was uh, was in part because it has. There are a lot of William and Mary has inroads to a lot of different places in the East Coast, which I found very appealing because I didn't know necessarily specifically where I wanted to settle, but. Um, a lot of our alumni find employment here in Virginia or um, in DC or in New York or um, uh, in a variety of places on the Eastern Seaboard. And I found that very appealing, just like I have options there. I can go many places. Um, and I think one thing that I've really enjoyed just about the culture and the atmosphere here among the students is you hear a lot of tales about like, because law school is graded on a curve about students being very cutthroat of just like, sabotage or being unwilling to help or a lot of that and I haven't found any of that at William and Mary it just it does feel fairly like collegial like we are all in this together oftentimes it it can be rough your one all year might be a little bit rough but that's true of law schools everywhere but there's there's sort of like a sense of camaraderie of like okay we can do this together and that I found in law in, in law school here that I that I found very appealing in high school. And if I can jump in there too, um, I want to say today was a great example of that in, in the clinics. Like one of the things that we did with our Clinic 2 students today who've come on, Mitch is one of them, who stayed with us through the entire year, was really just a collaborative, we had a collaborative work day. Um, and so it was all about like, we have a lot of things we got to do, a lot of submissions to get in. And so just that opportunity for everybody to work together asking questions, asking us questions, hearing answers from everybody else, that collaborative environment really permeates through everywhere. Like as a student, you're getting that your 1L year, like people studying together, you're getting that your 2L and 3L year with people advising about internships and opportunities, you know, and you're seeing that here in the clinics too, like just to really kind of hammer home that that's not kind of like a 
it's not just a line everybody says, everybody says it a lot because it's true. Um, and that extends to the alumni network, you know, with alums all over, you know, all over the country, but especially all up and down the East Coast. Like I am here to tell you our alumni network is awesome and really wants to be, really wants to be supportive of our current students and of our graduates. No matter when you graduated, an alum will help you. An alum will talk to you, give you that informational interview, give you an idea of what it's like. I got so many emails from current students when I was in New York that were, hey, I'm interested in immigration law. Can we talk about this? And I jump on the phone. You know, this was pre-Zoom, um, but, you know, jump on the phone and talk to people and really kind of help people get an idea of where they want to be. So all of those things carry on. That collegial attitude, that supporting each other, you know, starts day one and it continues on forever. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have a few moments um, before I open it up to uh, our audience questions. I did have, uh, this is a fun question, I think. Um, any advice or tips for incoming 1Ls to make the most of their law school experience? So I was I was most recently a 1L of, of our panelists <laughs> here. So I think I think I'll I'll go first. Um, so like I don't want to be cliche and say like 1L is what you make of it. Um, because so like uh, your courses are going to be functionally decided for you. You're going to be in. You're all going to be taking the same the, gr the same courses uh, in groups and sections. Um, and so I think a lot of the things that you do outside of those courses, I think that's where you can find a lot of the value in your 1L year. Um, I know William & Mary has uh, like a variety of student organizations that, that you can join as, um, and a lot of those organizations have mentorship programs where you can talk to, to 3Ls or 2Ls um, and just sort of pick their brain, get an understanding like not only of your professors in the classes, but also like how to find internships, um, how to apply for things, where and when. Um, so I think just sort of seeking out those opportunities to not only um, sort of improve improve your 1L year by like connecting with fellow students, but also just sort of like uh, gaining their knowledge um, and also just making friendships with, with the years above you. I think that is just a genuinely valuable thing. Um, and I think that's, it's worth your time to pursue that where you can. Nicole and I are both like leaning in, like who's gonna go? Um, I mean, obviously it's been like, it's been a minute since I was a, a 1L. Um, it's been a solid, solid 20 plus years. But um, I would say that from kind of the, my perspective as, you know, a former employer who would interview a lot of the students like in my old job and, and as a professor, like one thing that I would say is, you know, just kind of take some time to, to just be there as a 1L. Don't try to do too much. Like don't come in just like hair on fire, like I'm going to do everything all at the same time. I recommend as a 1L just being like, okay, I'm going to just learn how to read a case and I'm just going to learn how to do that really well. Okay. And I'm going to learn how I like to study. I'm going to learn how like to listen to like my professors and like how, how they like the dialogue that they facilitate in class and what they're trying to, to get me to learn. Um, and I think I completely echo Mitch's point about, you know, talking to other students and, and, you know, the two L's and three L's just to sort of see where the train is going. But I really, um, I, I, and I taught 1Ls for a long time in our legal practice program. And I would always say, you know, just like, just like take a breath, you know, and just kind of be, just be a 1L and just be okay with that because you have a lot going on. And so you don't need to join everything and do everything and feel like you have to be everywhere all at the same time. And so it kind of can feel counterintuitive. You're like, oh, am I getting, am I getting everything I should get out of this when I'm not, I'm not in all the things, I would say, yeah, you are, you know, because it's so foundational of a time that to be really intentional and present in that foundational time, I think is what will really help pay it forward when you're a 2L and a 3L. 
So I would almost say like, take that energy that you have, you know, everybody's just got a lot of energy when they walk in the door as well you should, um, and really channel it to, to just like, what are my professors saying and trying to teach me and like, and like really kind of lean into that instead of feeling like you have to be in 50 different places at once because you definitely don't. Um, so that, that's my, that's my 1L, um, 1L advice. <laughs> Now I'm worried because my 1L advice might sound completely counter to that. Um, and I think there is a way to follow to follow what I'm about to say and completely do everything Professor Kernshear just said because, yes, um, my advice is actually in a short sentence, explore everything. Um, so while you are slowly taking your way through 1L year, don't cut yourself off just because you think you know you want what you want to do when you come into law school. Um, you know, don't come in completely tunnel vision of I've heard of this one thing and this is all I ever want to do. Um, you might be right, in which case that's awesome. Um, and you might not be. Um, and so really taking the time to, you know, go listen to different speakers, you know, go to events like the Supreme Court preview to just hear about different kinds of things that you might not even realize are actually areas of the law. There's so many things that, you know, unless you have a parent or a close family member who is a lawyer, which I do not. Um, there are a lot of areas of law that you just don't even necessarily know exist until you get to law school. So take the time to just go sit in on a lunch panel discussion that we have. Um, go to the clinics asylum conference to learn more about immigration law. Like come to these different things and start to see like, hey, do I want to do that? Maybe that interests me. Maybe I should take a class in that, you know, again, as you get to 2L and 3L year, but really keep your options open and explore those things that when you come in, you know, you might not realize are of interest to you. And I can say for many people that actually turns out to be immigration law. They don't realize that's something that they want to do when they come to law school. And yet, you know, they get to the clinic and they're like, wait, this is what I want to do. This is awesome. Or revisit it later and how it intersects with other areas of work they enjoy. Thank you. Um, it's just about 7.30 and I am going to open it up um, for questions from our audience. Let's see. Um, someone has posted a question and um, excuse me, there are a number of questions, but they're interested in the immigration clinics projects like the Pathways to Hope Initiative. Um, and they're wondering if they could learn a little bit more about that. Sure. What a great question. So, um, so yeah, like as we've probably, you know, as you and whoever asked this question, way to do your homework. Yes. Um, so the Pathways to Hope initiative is something that we uh, partner with the William Mary School of Education. So as I was going to say, um, a lot of our clients, you know, have multidimensional issues in their life and their immigration status is just one of the, the issues that, that they're facing. And so um, something that we recognized kind of early on in, in the clinic's existence um, is that you know, the need for mental health supports uh, for uh, many of our clients. And so we uh, partnered with the uh, William Mary School of Education. They have um, a Flanagan uh, Clinic, which is where um, students at the School of Education that are learning to be um, therapists, that are learning to be counselors, um, where they get their hands-on experience. So we, you know, sort of establish this partnership to where, you know, the clients in the immigration clinic, those who may need um, mental health counseling and mental health support, would be able to get um, that support through the School of Education Flanagan um, Clinic. And so we, what we find is that many of our clients, you know, they may have a therapist, you know, through um, a case, you know, a case management system that they might be in, like through a shelter or through some sort of, you know, through a hospital or something. So they, you know, many of our clients may have that support already, but some of our clients do not. So not only do we think it's important, obviously, for our clients to have um, that mental health support that they need. Uh, for their own well-being. Um, it also can really, you know, be important for their immigration claim. There are many types of immigration claims where, you know, we have to prove, we have to show to the adjudicator that, you know, our client has suffered harm. And 
uh, you know, that harm sometimes may be physical and maybe, maybe people do have physical scars, but there are a lot of times that harm is not a physical scar. And it's something that has to be evaluated and articulated by a mental health professional. And I think that this brings up something that we talk about in the clinic and, and, you know, is that the limitations of, of, of being a lawyer, right? Like we're, we have, we have a role and we have a job and we have a skill set and we have, and we have what we do, but we don't do everything. And we can't do everything and we can't pretend like we could do everything because then we're, we're kind of doing our clients a disservice. Um, so it's important to be able to call in the resources uh, for our clients and the referrals that we can that we can then you know, point them to. So the Pathways to Hope initiative is an example of that, about how we can connect our clients to other types of support services that they need. Um, that we that we are you know both professionally and in a lot of ways uh, incapable of providing. Um, so those types of partnerships are really important. And I will say that that is something that is a real that's really, really important in doing the work of the clinic. Um, as a clinic, we partner with a lot of different organizations um, in our area. Um, you know, not just uh, the School of Ed with Pathways to Hope, but also, you know, a lot of shelters, caseworkers and managers at hospitals, as I mentioned, um, social services, um, uh, uh, faith-based, uh, you know, communities that provide support. Um, we have a very, you know, robust network of community partners. Uh, again, recognizing that we are here to serve a particular avenue or particular part of our clients' lives, but they have a lot of other um, needs. And so we help them get connected to those resources where we can. Um, thank you. There is a, uh, there's a great question about, um, is the application process for clinics at William and Mary guaranteed? And I, I wonder, um, maybe would be, be, yeah, I think I, I mean, I can, t I can, I can follow, I can see where this is going. Um, so the question is like, how do you get into a clinic and are you going to be able to take one? Uh, I, I'm guessing that's basically what the question is. So there is no, there's no application process for the clinics um, and, you know, separate and apart. Like once you are a student, you know, you would you register for a clinic in the same way that you would register for any class. Um, so there's no extra application process um, on top of getting admitted uh, to William & Mary. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, now, there are a few clinics that are limited to 3Ls because you have to have what is called the 3L practice certificate in order to appear in Virginia court. So that would be something, you know, like I think DV and, and family, um, because you're going to local court, um, to you have to have a third year practice certificate. So that's, you know, that's something that would not be available to 2Ls, but that's just that's just the nature of, of that practice area. Um, but there isn't like a separate application process. So, you know, it is, um, I guess it can be competitive, competitive in the sense that you kind of have to be quick on the on the button, like on the day of registration, uh, you know, because they, they fill up. Uh, but, you know, there's nothing that, you know, screens people out um, of taking a clinic. Um, if I may just jump in here really quick. Um, so I actually have, jumping off that, I have um, an addendum to my 1L advice is um, um, at the end of your 1L year, you're going to have the opportunity to register for classes, for the classes that you want um, to take your 2L year. My best piece of concrete advice is um, do your utmost to not oversleep by two hours like I did, um, because the, the bidding, the registration process opens at a fixed time. Um, and if you sleep past that, um, you, you will have slightly fewer options available because some courses are more popular and do fill up quickly. So just speaking towards the competitiveness, um, you might have, sometimes you do have to be fast and also not asleep. Thank you, Mitchell. That, that was, uh, everyone is going to remember that now, I think. Um, this is going, a question is about uh, the personal aspect, how the difficulties as a person, as a student, as a professional of working with clients in the clinic, um, 
and how do you kind of cope with um, uh, stress and uh, I'm sure a lot of concerns, uh, worry. Mm -hmm. What a great question. It's such an important part of this work. And I think that both like, you know, in addition to me, like Mitch and Nicole definitely want um, your perspectives on this too. Um, so from a, you know, from a, from a kind of pedagogy, from a design perspective, right, of the clinic, uh, you know, being uh, open and teaching about the difficulty of this work and about self-care and about boundaries and about like, you know, you the, how to do this from that personal, you know, in that personal way is extremely important. Um, it is built into our curriculum in the immigration clinic um, to acknowledge and to talk about the difficulty um, and to learn how to um, just kind of like a lot of skills, like learn how to recognize in yourself, um, where am I starting to perhaps um, need, you know, maybe some additional self-care strategies. And, and so, you know, we, we do, we do have very difficult cases um, and to be sustained in this work and to be able to do this work on a sustained level um, is it's necessary to acknowledge that and to understand like how to how one may you know work as an advocate in difficult spaces, not just immigration. Again, this is transferable because you could be working in other spaces that are also um, very difficult to work in. So I would say, you know, I want to give the space for Mitch and Nicole to talk, but you know, we talk about what are our own um, self-care strategies and our own ways of coping, uh, basically in this work, Nicole and I do this whole, like, you know, like, like song and dance on how we have different strategies. We're different in terms of how we approach it. And I think what's really important to remember and to, and to acknowledge is that in the clinic, like Nicole and I don't pretend that like everything's cool all the time. We don't pretend like this work doesn't affect us as human beings. Like we don't pretend that, you know, like everything is going to work out all the time because it's not. And so we really do, um, we're honest with the students. We give space for people to talk about um, how the work is affecting them. But at the same time, acknowledging that I'm not a mental health professional, Nicole is not either. So we have, we give space to to talk about it and to talk about our, our self-care strategies and to how to, to kind of do this work, but also making sure that students know, you know, what are the resources available to them, you know, in terms of mental health resources outside of the clinic space, because I can provide my perspective, but that's my perspective. And I would be doing the students a disservice if I represented that somehow I was a kind of a professional in this regard. So it is something that is extremely important in this area of law. Um, to, to walk in knowing that part of this work is going to be, how do I take care of myself and do this work? And that is something that we, we really do talk about a lot and we build into the immigration clinic curriculum. So Nicole and Mitch, I definitely want to hear um, from you as well. Yeah, I think I want to jump in too, because part of, in a sustained way, being able to do this work is thinking about what is a win. I think you're setting yourself up for a lot of being upset, a lot of disappointment, and it's not that, you know, I'm perfect at this at all, but it's important to constantly ask yourself, like, what is a win in my case? If you always measure a win by how many U visas you get granted, U visas take five years to get approved. It's really hard then to say, like, you know, to feel sustained and to feel like you're doing something. But one thing that people don't often realize about immigration law is that there is no right to an attorney. You know, so when we think about your law and order reading off your rights, anybody who is in immigration court, for example, no right to an attorney. Um, people who've been evacuated and brought to the United States from Afghanistan, people who have fled the war in Ukraine, no right to an attorney to help them to stay here. And so when we as the clinic, so, you know, when Mitch is working on a case for somebody, you know, when our students are going with somebody to their asylum interview, when we are compassionately interviewing people about the worst things that they've been through, when we are standing with them through all of this, that in and of itself is a win. That is somebody who is being heard, 
sometimes for the first time to really like tell their story and assert their rights when often they haven't been listened to or even been, you know, shot down for trying to assert their rights in many situations. And so in terms of like keeping yourself sustained and doing this, part of it is sometimes reframing that and understanding that. Um, it's why, you know, if you go to the victories tab on our blog, it's not just about like, you know, what did we, how many asylum cases have we won? It's about how many people have a work permit now? Like how many more people can work because of what we're doing? How many more people are not having to go to immigration court and are out of removal proceedings because of what our students have been doing? And I think that's one of those things that can help keep you going when things are at a low, low is to say, yeah, but what? what have I accomplished? What have I done? And all of these are the things that, you know, we remind ourselves and each other. So just jumping off of the, the, the framing of the wins. So sometimes uh, uh, during, in clinic, we would start uh, with like, um, does anyone have any updates on their case? Um, sometimes uh, um, SKS or Nicole will have like a, an update, like there's been a break, we've gotten some news back and like the mood is genuinely celebratory when that happens. Um, I remember like it's, I remember something from one of my cases last semester that seems that almost sounds um, small, but like I do genuinely think was just like such a relief was um, uh, I had um, clients that were uh, applying for temporary protected status, um, and we got um, notification later that um, that they would not have to go and have their biometrics taken again. Um, and that sounds like such a small thing, but for them it would have been a two hour or two or three hour car uh, drive that they would have to go to um, on their time off, um, an additional additional expense on people who um, who like frankly, don't need that hassle. They, they have other things going on in their lives, other difficulties. And even something as small as, as that can just feel just genuinely rewarding. Like, I've done my job properly. They, they're, they have, and their lives are just like a little bit easier because of, of the work that we've managed to accomplish. Um, and I think just remembering the sort of camaraderie that we discussed previously, um, we do get a lot of difficult cases in the clinic. Um, we mentioned previously, like the Violence Against Women Act is, is, is one of the inroads, like, is one of the like sectors of immigration law that can be very trying. I know um, one of my fellow students had a case like that that was just very hard for them to deal with. And I remember just like seeing them talk about it with uh, other students, just like being able to open up about how difficult it was to prepare for that call and to hear the details of it like you can you can it was you were able to see it visibly become a little easier to bear just through the act of talking about it um amongst amongst their peers and i thought that was just something i profoundly appreciate i was just like it can be hard but it does get a little easier when when you're able to be open about it and talk and get that feedback and reflect uh with with your peers um, I just wanted to note for people, I did put a link to the immigration blog um, that Nicole mentioned uh, in the chat and also our connect and visit page. And I put it there because um, you'll see a list of upcoming events um, that the admissions office is hosting. Someone had asked about learning about um, our veterans benefits clinic. We have a related uh, panel coming up next Wednesday, which is going to be the panel is of um, veteran and service members of our law school community, um, faculty and students. And in fact, one of the panelists is the co-director of uh, the Veterans Benefits Clinic. You might want to attend that, or also if you can just send us a note at law, uh, lawadm at williamandmary.edu um, and ask your question, either the question about the Veterans Benefits Clinic or any of the questions that are appearing on the um, Q and A. Um, We'll try to get you um, a response and information as soon as possible. Um, we're coming up at 7.49. Um, let's see. Here's an interesting question. Um, Nicole, uh, this is sort of in your area, but um, we have Dean Rahman with us as well. Um, 
I'm wondering what percentage of those who concentrate in immigration law at William & Mary majored in international relations as an undergraduate? So uh, I'll speak to this a little bit, like on a technical level, there's no kind of concentration in immigration law. Um, so I know the law school has several concentrations. Um, it's just kind of one of those things, and especially when I was here, but, he, but even still now that you just take classes in, you know, get experience in. Um, one thing that I have to say that I actually really, really love about the immigration clinic is, you know, I do come at it with a certain perspective because I was an international affairs major. But the reality is, is that I've re everybody in the clinic has studied so many different things. And it's actually what makes us better at our cases. You know, it's not everybody who has studied international affairs. We've all like got the same background and whatnot. No, we have people. And again, check out the blog. I know I keep talking about it, but it's true. We have so many student perspectives there. We have students who've been teachers. We have students who have, you know, different master's degrees, who speak lots of different languages. You know, we have students coming in speaking Korean, Russian, Japanese, Spanish, French, you know, all Arabic, you name it, all of these different backgrounds backgrounds actually serve really, really well in this area of work because, you know, I like to joke that I majored in country conditions, which is an important element of research in an asylum case. But you know what? Sometimes you really need the public health background to be able to understand like how to build different kinds of cases. You need that teacher background because you're in tune to um, how trauma impacts children and getting the research we need to prove a case that way. So there's a lot of different backgrounds that actually serve very, very well in this work. Um, so while certainly that is my background and the way that I approach the work, there is no prereq or, you know, perfect major, or perfect background, uh, perfect background to have in this. Yeah, I just also want to echo that I was a sociology and French major. So, you know, I think sociology is a perfect major uh, to do immigration work and actually just to do the law. But, um, I, you know, and this is a question that is a, that is a that is a, a, a shade of, of a question that happened that comes up a lot in terms of like, you know, what's the right like major um, for, you know, law school or a particular area of the law. Um, and it just sort of can't emphasize enough that whatever your major was, that's the right major, okay? Um, because it really is um, so, you know, multi, you know, immigration law in particular, so in the immigration casework, so multidisciplinary, especially the type of work we do, um, that, you know, I just don't want anyone to feel like, oh, I, ha I don't have the right background, you know, substantively. Um, that to me doesn't exist. Um, you are a human being who has been operating in the world and has gone through um, undergraduate and maybe done other things as well. Like you have, you have, you know, what you, what you need and what you build upon in order to be successful um, in this area of law and others. So, you know, I used to get this question a lot uh, when I was teaching one else, you know, just kind of like, you know, like kind of this. some people were like, you know, very, a little bit nervous, you know, that they were coming into law school, like starting at some sort of deficit uh, based on their undergraduate major. And I just can't emphasize enough that if you're carrying that concern, I want you just to like, let it, I just want you to like get it out of there because it doesn't, it, it just, it just shouldn't be a concern and you're going to be fine. Okay. So I've said my piece on that. <laughs> I'll add one more piece. My maid of honor, who was a William Mary Law School graduate, was a physics major undergrad. Um, while she does patent work now, she has taken immigration cases pro bono, um, really enjoys doing that. And my husband was an English major, um, doing a lot of playwriting, and is now a public defender, very successful in his work as well. So you really can do a lot of different things and, again, bring those strengths to the table. Thank you. Um, let's see. Let's see. Um, there's some specific questions about the application process. And again, um, some of them might be better. Uh, Michelle uh, is on the receiving end of law ADM at William and Mary, uh, edu and be happy to um, uh, answer those questions. Um, Absolutely. Well, we have a few more minutes. Um,
Can I ask a little bit about uh, outside of the clinics? Um, I know summer employment is very important and there are internship opportunities. So let's talk a little bit about skills building uh, outside of the clinics. What, what sort of opportunities are there? Um, yeah. Oh, there we go. Um, you mean like in the immigration clinic, like with respect to the immigration clinic? Um, actually, um, more broadly, um, you know, for example, you mentioned that you're a le- you were a legal writing professor at one point. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that is something that, um, again, didn't go to law school, but I've heard when I'll say that, um, you know, without any background, they learn to write like lawyers. And that's something that they're going to use for the rest of their, um, the rest of their careers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, outside of the clinics, uh, you know, obviously as a 1L, you know, you would get that foundation in, you know, practice and legal writing and uh, legal analysis through all your classes. And I mean, I would just say that, you know, a lot of times there's what I've observed in and, and, you know, kind of heard from students is, you know, just a real concern that if I don't get like, you know, like some sort of perfect job that I, that fits, you know, what I kind of idealize as the perfect job, like am I one all summer, you know, that, you know, it, it, am I, am I, is all hope lost? Am I doomed? You know, and the answer to that question is definitely not. Um, you know, I think that, you know, and when you think about approaching 1L year and you think about approaching, you know, opportunities going forward to, you know, 1L summer, you know, summer after your first year and into your um, 2L and 3L years, um, you know, thinking about, you know, what kinds of uh, opportunities do you want to just seek out? And I think this goes back to Nicole's point from earlier about, you know, being exploratory, like being curious about different about different areas of the law, different types of, of jobs, different types of organizations you can work for. And I think that, you know, if you approach, you know, externships, you know, internships opportunities, like things, again, like outside the clinic to like build skills, if you approach that with, you know, I don't have to know that this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I don't have to know that this is that this is like exactly what I want to do. Just go and and find out, you know, like figure out is this something that interests me? You know, I would talk to students a lot about, you know, what types of what types of problems do you like thinking about? Like what types of what types of activities do you like to do? Right? Are you somebody that likes to read and write, or are you somebody that likes to stand up and? and talk? Like, do you never want to see the inside? Do you think you never want to see the inside of a courtroom? Like, you know, so like what types of things do you like to do? What types of problems do you like to think about? Or what types of communities do you want to serve? You know, like these are types of of questions that you can ask yourself in terms of like exploring what different options may be without pigeonholing yourself too soon um, in, in the type of work you want to do. So I would just recommend that, you know, you know, clinics outside the clinics, just really kind of keeping an open mind and not like self-limiting and, and, you know, unintentionally, I mean, you know, if we had more time, I can tell you that my, you know, my career is a journey, you know, of, of a thousand places and I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I think that part of that is, you know, kind of always looking and always self-reflecting about what it is that really motivates you and like really gets you up in the morning. Cause if you're doing what you love, it's going to, it's going to be a joy to do and, and you're going to be even better at it. So, you know, sort of thinking about, you know, looking forward and and being curious and exploring in different areas is something that I think does transcend the clinical experience or even like your curricular choices and can can really uh, inform, you know, what you might choose to do in externships and internships and other opportunities outside of the law school building. I'll tack on just a shout out um, as a concrete example of this, of what we have William Mary, the Post-Conflict Justice Center. And I'm totally going to butcher the name. I was just trying to look it up to make sure that I got the full name. But what a great opportunity for people who are international oriented. This is the kind of work that interests you and things like that. Like what a great thing to explore um, for your 1L or 2L summer um, in terms of getting funded internship opportunities with an international bend, experience in international law that can serve you well in potentially an immigration career. Um, so just want to like throw that out there as a very concrete example of what Professor Kernshear is talking about um, and something, you know, another good way to learn about the offerings here at William Mary. 
I was just um, looking that up, Nicole. I'll put it in the chat. It is the Center for Comparative Legal Studies and Post-Conflict Peacebuilding. Yes, that's it. And so Professor Warren's summer internship program is robust and incredible. Um, and I credit that with um, getting me started on my pathway, my 1L summer. So um, very, a very wonderful opportunity to check out. Okay, it, it is 8 p.m. Um, and I think I'm going to uh, release our panelists um, and thank everyone who joined us um, uh, tonight who are prospective students or others. Um, please remember that um, I put the um, connect and visit if you'd like to learn more about William and Mary. Um, oh, a hand up from uh, Dean Rahman. I just wanted to thank everybody for being with us tonight and to let people know that uh, if they're hearing it, it's too late to apply. It is not. Uh, and for those who have attended tonight, if they uh, would like to avail themselves of a fee waiver uh, to in order to make it easier for them to apply, uh, we'll be happy to hear from them. And they can certainly just reach out to uh, the law ADM uh, at williammary.edu uh, box. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to say good night and thank our panelists. And thank you all. And and visit the immigration clinic blog. Like if you haven't gone to the blog, that's what you to do. Okay, because we keep it going. So please visit our blog. We have our link to our impact report, um, student, um, you know, student commentary, uh, how to contact us, all the things. Like so, please, 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 if you have any interest or if we piqued your interest or whatever, um, the, the immigration clinic blog. So really, if you like Google, like William and Mary immigration clinic blog, it's going to be there or you can find us through the website, but definitely um, is a great place. Just dig deep, dive deeply into the immigration clinic blog because we have a lot. We have a lot there. So thanks, everybody, for being here. And shout out to Mitch. His post is right there on the top. So if you <laughs> want to learn more like about what this guy is doing, check it out. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.